Good evening, uh, and welcome to the first public event for the uh, Center for the Humanities uh, for this year, this academic year. Of course, we were all hoping we'd be in person at this point, but uh, um, nonetheless, I'm glad that you could join us via Zoom. My name is Hugh Thomas. I'm the director for the Center for the Humanities. Um, and uh, before I introduce the speaker, I'll just say a few words, although um, I'm sure you uh, all have lots of experience with Zoom by now, but we'll have the talk. And uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free at any point to type the questions into the question and answer section. And uh, with uh, no further ado, uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker for tonight, Lillian Mansour. Uh, in preparation for the introduction, I took a look at her CV uh, and uh, it's 33 pages. Uh, so that should tell you something right there. And that's from two years ago. So it's probably 50 pages by now, uh, but suffice it to say that uh, Professor Manzur is a big deal in Cuban studies. Uh, she has published numerous articles, edited books, uh, written books. Uh, she has uh, won numer uh, numerous grants, uh, including prestigious ones, such as uh, awards from the NEH and from the Mellon Foundation. Uh, she's got uh, various important uh, professional obligations. She's on the uh, board of Cuban Studies Journal. Uh, she's uh, involved in various professional asso associations uh, in Cuban and Latin American studies. She's the former chair of Modern Languages and Literatures here at UM. Uh, so um, this is uh, a presentation by really one of our excellent scholars uh, in a field in which uh, the University of uh, Miami is quite strong or maybe the larger field of Caribbean studies and Latin American studies and the uh, more specific field of uh, Cuban studies. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Professor Manzor. Thank you, uh, Hugh, for, uh, for this inter invite. And uh, thank you, everyone who is with us tonight. Um, before I start, uh, a trigger warning. There are a couple of slides that uh, have partial nudity. So apologies for this, but um, I'm talking about off of Broadway. So my presentation tonight focuses on the role of US Cubans and Puerto Ricans and the role that they played in the off of Broadway theater movement in New York during the 1960s and early 70s. It comes from the second chapter of my forthcoming book which is about US Cuban theater during the 80s and 90s. This chapter grounds the book historically and places the artists I study in relation to Maridene Fornes and to the off of Broadway productions that set a precedent for their plays. I analyze the productions of Fornes and two US Cuban theater artists, Magalia Labao and Manuel Martin Jr., whose involvement in the off of Broadway movement has gone largely unnoticed. Although Fornes is seen as a progenitor of the off of Broadway movement, uh, no one has analyzed her first play, La Viuda, The Widow. I suggest that this play's lack of critical attention is representative of the marginalization of Spanish language plays in the 60s. But I'm not gonna talk about La Viuda tonight. Um, I'm actually going to focus on uh, Manuel Martin Jr. And let me share my screen here. Okay, so uh, in the second half of the chapter, which is uh, my presentation today, is devoted to Manuel Martin Jr.'s early work as actor, director, and playwright to demonstrate how he, alongside actress and poet Magalia Larao, Latinized off of Broadway. I bring back three key U.S. Cuban theater artists to put them into dialogue with the networks of their Puerto Rican and Anglo off of Broadway contemporaries and to demonstrate how they shaped what I term Latina off of Broadway. I analyze how the retooling of themes and aesthetics coming from non-US traditions, namely Latin American and European avant-garde theaters were key to their theatrical process. 
However, the use of Spanish language combined with that very aesthetics remained unreadable to English language theater critics who pushed their work away from off of Broadway to the nascent Spanish or Hispanic theater as the newspapers referred to Latino theater in New York during its nascent years. Methodologically, I carry out some historiography of the period. I analyze archival materials related to their theater making practice and reconstruct the performances by reading not only the manuscripts, but also photographs, stage and costume designs, musical scores, documentary videos, theater reviews, and other archival ephemera. I also analyze the relationships between various actors and spaces that produce the network that I'm calling Latine Off of Broadway. Informed by network and assemblage theories, I look at social structures adapted to theatrical production, consumption, and dissemination, including the physical spaces, locations, and networks of proximity of artisan critics important to the analysis of theatrical production and reception. <clears throat> There are many studies of the off-of-Broadway movement of the 50s and 60s. However, the role of Latinas in off-of-Broadway, with the exception of Maridene Fornes, who is considered a major force of this movement, has been absent from its historiography. Off-of-Broadway has never been read in relation to the incipient Latino theater in 1960s in New York. Neither has the development of Latina theater in New York been analyzed vis-a-vis off-of-Broadway. The study of both Latino theater and off of Broadway theater archives now available show many points of contact between the two. Marilene Fornes, Manuel Martin Jr. and Magali Alabao were some of the oldest, most active and most creative participants of the US Cuban stages. Fornes left Cuba in 1945, settling in New York. She took a folk dancing class at the New York at the New School for Social Research and found a new community in the post-war counterculture of Greenwich Village, where she lived for most of her adult life. At the New School for Social Research, there was already another Cuban artist, Andres Castro, working with Erwin Piscator, as well as the Puerto Rican actress Miriam Colon, the first Latina to be accepted into Piscator's dramatic workshop and into Actors Studio. Piscator was a famous German theatrical director and producer, originator of epic theater with Bertolt Brecht. A refugee from Hitler's Germany and Stalin's Russia, he emigrated to the US in 1939 and founded the Dramatic Workshop at the New School for Social Research in 1940. In the Dramatic Workshop, he expounded the concept of total theater, which required much more than new theatrical architecture and effects. He believed that theater artists had to know the craft of theater and needed to be well-versed in all of its aspects. He shared the need to have a politically committed theater that was also experimental. As we will see, the transculturated legacy of Piscator through Andres Castro's work in New York and Cuba left an imprint in Latina off of Broadway. Manuel Martin Jr. arrived in New York in 1955 to study acting at the Lee Strasberg studio, precisely when Fornes had left New York to live in Europe. In New York, Martin found that commercial theater had consolidated with Broadway and they produced primarily musicals. Playwrights and directors who were interested in a different kind of theater started to function in smaller, space, smaller spaces close to the Broadway theater scene, giving rise to what is known as off-Broadway. After 1958, Several artists like Fornes and Martin, who rejected off-Broadway aesthetics, started to work in small non-performing spaces, Cafe Chino in the West Village, Al Carmine's Judson's Poets Theater in Judson Memorial Church, and Ellen Stewart's at La Mama in the Lower East Side, were some of the most important artists and spaces of what became the off-of-Broadway theater movement. Using coffee houses and unused lofts, Experimental plays were performed and remained at the beginning of the circuit of reviews and theater criticism. One of the most important aspects of these spaces is that they served as a theater lab for a generation of playwrights and directors who would eventually change US theater. In those alternative spaces, playwrights experimented with form and content. They often had nudity on stage, the audience participated actively in the performances and they erased the boundary between theatrical genres and artistic media. Originally a space where playwrights could experiment, by the end of the 60s, 
theater directors and producers practically displays the role playwrights uh, had held as creators and originators of theatrical concepts and language. Perhaps the best analysis of this change was Tom Ayen's satirical piece in the New York Times titled The Discreet Alarm of the Off-of-Broadway Playwright, where he describes an imagined dinner with the 20 plus playwrights who founded the playwright strategy. In this article, Ayen underscores that, and I quote, playwrights need much more than financial support. They need public and critical affirmation. New playwrights are being produced and reviewed by their fathers who live in a world they have, in a world they have lost touch with, end quote. Off of Broadway, welcome black theater artists. The Greenwich Muse Theater, La Mama and Joseph Papp, for example, were pioneers in non-traditional casting, freely mixing actors of various races. However, there rarely is a mention of Latino artists who worked in Spanish. And when they're mentioned, the critics do not differentiate between Latino companies. A good example is Mel Gosso. In an article on Off of Broadway, he mentions how Tisa Shang founded the Pan-Asian Pan Repertory Theater at La Mama, and then continues to name Repertorio Español, the Puerto Rican Traveling Theater, and the New Yorkers Poets Cafe as, and I quote, the Hispanic companies appealing to a bilingual audience, end quote. There's no reference to dual theater at La Mama and no differentiation between the off-of-Broadway aesthetics of the New Yorkers Poets Cafe versus the more traditional theater companies. The role of Cubans and Puerto Ricans in the off-of-Broadway theater movement is practically non-existent in the historiography of both Latino as well as Anglo-American studies of off-of-Broadway. This absence is due in part to the lack of archival resources for Latino theater and the lack of cross-geographical, interdisciplinary, and transnational approaches to Latina theater studies. The materials of Miriam Colon Puerto Rican Traveling Theater Collection at Hunter College Center for Puerto Rican Studies and Intar Theater Records, along with the multiple theater collections at the University of Miami Cuban Heritage Collection, allow us now to establish pan-Latine artistic networks as well as Latine and Anglo-American ones. Through these network, through these networks, process of transculturation took place via the many points of contact as well as differences between Latino and off of Broadway theaters. During the 1960s, Manuel Martin Jr. was in New York taking acting lessons first with Caroline Brenner and then with Andres Castro, who founded the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. Between 67 and 69, Martin studied with Luis Frasberg, where, according to Martin, there were only two Latinos. And I quote Martin. My accent seemed to shake up the foundations of Carnegie Hall building, where Strasburg had his studio and projects with Actors Studio, end quote. In New York, Martin acted both in English and Spanish and was interested in avant-garde off of Broadway aesthetics, but he found himself at a crossroads, and I quote him again. I became disenchanted for having to play Latino characters the way that North Americans see us, not how we are, end quote. Indeed, Puerto Rican actors, Raul Julia, Miriam Colón, and many others had been playing stereotypical Latin characters since the 1950s. Let me share my screen again. In 1967, Martin met actress Magali Alabao at the Greenwich Muse production of La Celestina. Alabao had recently arrived in New York after one of the plays she had directed in Havana, Cain's Mangles, was censored and she fell victim to the persecution of homosexuals. When La Celestina's run finished, both swore that they would never do that kind of theater ever again. Dissatisfied with the nascent theater in Spanish in New York, the lack of directorial and acting training in Spanish in the city, and the lack of opportunity for Latino actors with an accent to play interesting characters in English, they decided to found Duo Theater, one of New York's earliest Latina theater companies. In 1969, they opened Teatro Duo, a tiny 27 seat theater in New York's East 12th Street. The name reflected its dual artistic and community goals to produce experimental and avant-garde Latin American and Spanish plays in English for an Anglo audience and experimental North American playwrights in Spanish for a Latina audience. 
Their first production was Penitence, written and directed by Roberto Rodriguez Suarez, who was an important Puerto Rican playwright, director, and acting instructor. As a playwright, Rodriguez Suarez is considered the father of New Yorican theater. Although his earlier plays straddle thematically and dramaturgically New York's El Barrio and Puerto Rico, his later plays are more exper experimental and closer to off of Broadway aesthetics. As a matter of fact, in New York, he followed closely avant-garde and experimental theater, especially the work of the living theater and open theater. Rodriguez Suarez was also a very important theater director. Oscar Colón called him the Lee Strasberg of Puerto Rican theater. He directed the first New York production of La Carreta, The Ox Cart, in 1953, which led to his founding with Miriam Colón of Círculo Dramático Puerto Riqueño. Both director and actress found a space in, Manha in Manhattan and they named it Teatro Arena. Their first production was a play by Cuban player Ramon Ferreira and directed by Humberto Arenal. Círculo Dramático Puerto Riqueño and Teatro Arena have entered the recent history of Latina theater as the first Puerto Rican and Latina theater group in New York to have its own space. Manuel Martín and Roberto Rodríguez Suárez knew each other well. Martín, as I have mentioned, looked for every opportunity he had to act in newer and more experimental plays. As a matter of fact, he, rate, he played the role of Tonton in Rodríguez Suárez's Lily 14th in 1968, along with New Yorican Virginia Rea and the Cubans Roberto Robles and Paul de Alba, all actors who later performed in various productions of duo theater. Thus, it is not surprising that Martina Nalabao decided to open their theater with Penitence, an English rendition of an experimental play written in Spanish by the father of New Yorican theater. First, Penitence aesthetics fit within duo theater's mission. Second, staging a Puerto Rican play in 1969 in English was an important move of coalitional politics if we take into consideration the sociopolitical situation of Latinas in 1969. This year marked the height of the Puerto Rican student movement in New York. There were sit-ins at major universities demanding courses and programs in Puerto Rican studies. Some theater groups, such as the Puerto Rican Traveling Theater, began to stage plays in English, trying to reach an audience that was not only Spanish speaking. This sparked a debate within the Puerto Rican theatrical community in relation to language. Some felt that they should be focusing on plays in Spanish, while others believed that it was important to produce plays in English to reach not only a, a wider audience, but also those members of the community who were English dominant or bilinguals. Finally, Penitence was a golden opportunity for what duo theater was searching, experimental plays from the Latina tradition that could show other ways of being or performing Latinidad in both an Anglo-centric off-of-Broadway movement and in the aesthetically more traditional Hispanic theater. The network resulting from the articulations of Latino theater artists from various national origins in New York with non-Latino artists and the spaces in which they performed was expanded through the plays that followed Penitence in Teatro Duo since they continued with the experimental vein in both Spanish and English and used Latina and non-Latina actors. Their second production was a double bill of two world premieres in English. Abelardo Estorino's Games Mangos, directed by Magali Alabao, the play that, as, as I mentioned, was banned in Cuba, and Impossible Loves by exiled Spaniard Fernando Arrabal, directed by Elaine Williams. New York had seen two of Arrabal's plays at La Mama Experimental Theater Club. Let's remember that La Mama was very interested in connecting with avant-garde and non-Anglo theater makers since the early 60s. Duo's production in 1969 of Arrabal, immediately after Bettina Knapp's translation appeared in the drama review, actually marked the first time that Arrabal was performed in English in New York. As a matter of fact, we could say that Duo Theater staging initiated Arrabal's revival in Off of Broadway, where La Mama had many productions of his plays throughout the 1970s. Duo Theater followed Arrabal's production, staging the first plays of Cuban playwright Virgilio Piñera in the US, including Dos Viejos Panicos, Two Old Panics in Spanish, directed by Mario Peña. Duo Theater's production of Two Old Panics a year after its publication in Havana is its world premiere. 
Piñera, in an article published in Conjunto, stated, and I quote, I think that one would have to look for the key to my theater in what we call a limit situation, end quote. I believe that it was that limit situation what seduced the two directors who were living their own limit situation as immigrants and exiles in New York, trying to produce avant-garde theater in Spanish in a city which only recognized avant-garde theater as the ones produced in English. Tavo and Tota's fear, Tavo and Tota's are the main characters of Two Old Panics. Their fear and negation, a Cubanized and now Latinized version of theater of the absurd were perfect for the off of Broadway aesthetics and for dual theater space. Celia Sanchez, an abstract painter from the Cuban group Los Once, who had moved to New York in 1961, created the set design during the period in which she was painting and uh, just working on her erotic topologies. Celia Sanchez had worked with Andres Castro in Las Mascaras in Havana in the 1950s. And in New York, she designed for him a Nunes Antigone, which premiered in April, 1969. Thus, abstraction and eroticism framed dual theater's early experimentation with theater of the absurd. While in Cuba, Piñera was condemned for being a homosexual and for clinging on to those old obsessions that did not reflect the new revolutionary society. In the US, Martina Nalabao selected him to bring a breath of fresh air to theater in Spanish in New York. Between Spanish and English, eroticism and experimentation, this production added another layer to Latina off of Broadway. These early productions of dual theater are a perfect example of his transculturation on articulation of various traditions, Cuban avant-garde theatrical practices, Cubanized European theater of the absurd, and Latinized off of Broadway aesthetics. I would like to return briefly to Ayan's previous concerns about the off of Broadway playwright in order to, to address the situation of Latina theater artists in New York at the time, especially those who were producing in Spanish experimental plays with avant-garde techniques. We find that the fate of the Latino artists was like that of the off-of-Broadway playwright. Since they didn't have producers, they were producing their own work using the salaries from their day jobs. Productions seldom received critical affirmation in the press in English. When reviewed, it was primarily by the Spanish press, which was often out of touch with what was going on in contemporary Anglo theatrical circles. It is, um, as is still often the case, anything produced in Spanish was lumped together and labeled Spanish speaking theater. Dos Viejos Panicos was advertised in the New York Magazine in the same page as Fornes uh, Promenade and three traditional companies in Spanish by the Greenwich Muse Spanish Theater, precursor of Repertorio Español. Spanish theatrical productions, as I've mentioned, were seldom covered and especially not in the New York Times until October 1973, when Richard Shepard published in the Going Out Guide, a section which started with Teatro, as you see in capital letters and bold, where he asserted that Spanish speaking theater has undeniably become a staple in New York. In 1972, Martin Jr. returned to the stage with La Estrella y la Monja, the Spanish version of the off of, off of Broadway's Tom Ayans the White Whore and the Big Player. La Estrella became the most important event of the year for Latino theater in New York. Furthermore, it passed on to history as being the first Latino play to put complete nudity on stage. Magali Alabao played the star, a central and ethereal character roughly based on the life of Marilyn Monroe. Gabriela Mas played the nun, its masochist and deranged alter ego. Both would transform from one character to another, changing costumes in front of the audience who was already used to this technique. Martin's version set in a madhouse added a Greek chorus with nine male lunatics who offer nuances absent from Aeon's play. The New York Times review highlighted the importance of this play in Spanish, even when the choice of words other the group. And I quote, what these people, the inter-workshop unit have done with have done with and to Mr. Ayans, one actor, provides a dazzling tour de force of make-believe and a numbing theatrical experience. It will hook you and shake you even if you don't understand a word of Spanish. We do not, end quote. 
photographs and reviews ap aptly captured the visuality and theatricality of this production, which also impressed theater critics. Manolo Garcia Oliva, for example, was the first to realize what this production meant for Latina theater in New York. And I quote, the remnants of conventionalism of our Hispanic theater have been completely eliminated. I argue that this staging unquestionably inserted Latino theater in Spanish into off of Broadway's experimental theater. Such is the case that Ellen Stewart invited Duo Theater to become a resident company of La Mama with their 1972-73 season. Manuel Martin and Magalia Lavao had been regulars at La Mama since the mid 1960s and Martin was Ellen Stewart's personal friend. Alabao remembers, and I quote, in that small and cold basement, Ellen's charismatic personality with her little bell and her Creole accent transported us to that dream that germinated of creating an avant-garde Latin theater, end quote. In January, 1973, they did the same staging of La Estrella in two versions, one in Spanish and the other one with its English title, White Whore and the Big Player. That Ciela Mas character of the nun was played by Hortensia Colorado, the Chichimeco Tomiko founder of Las Colorado Theater Company. Magalia Lavao was replaced by none other than Candy Darling, the great trans actress who had become one of Andy Warhol's superstars. According to Martin, Alabao was replaced because of her accent. Before I analyze the reasons why this replacement is both interesting and problematic, I must return to the issue of accents, particularly on the US stages. Social linguists have demonstrated that everyone speaks with an accent. People's linguistic variations depend on the area where they were raised. In other words, standard American English is an abstraction and accents are a social construction. The reason why in the US, a French accent tends to be acceptable while a Spanish accent is not, is the result of language ideology and power differential. Mary Matsuda in her groundbreaking article on accent, on accent discrimination explains the following. When the parties are in a relationship of domination and subordination, we tend to say that the dominant is normal and the subordinate is different from normal. And so it is with accent. Everyone has an accent, but when, when an employer refuses to hire a person with an accent, they're referring to a hidden norm of a non-accent, non a linguistic impossibility, but a socially constructed reality. People in power are, are perceived as speaking normal, unaccented English. Any speech that is different from that constructed norm is called an accent. Matsuda's analysis informs my reading of Alabao's replacement by Candy Darling. It is well documented that La Mama was the place where one could see European avant-garde influences on experimentation. La Mama audiences were accustomed to European accents, which were associated with avant-garde aesthetics. In non-artistic realms, most European sounding accents were and are considered prestigious and intelligible, whereas a Spanish accent was and is considered low status and incomprehensible. Matsuda clarifies that the ideological dimension of accent discrimination is the creation and maintenance of a belief system that sees some as worthy and others as, un as unworthy based on accent, so, such that disparities in wealth and power are naturalized. Ellen Stewart herself spoke with undistinguishable peculiar accents depending where and to whom she was speaking. Sometimes her speech sounded a bit like French, others like Gichi. Alabao characterized it as Creole. Wickham Boyle, La Mama's executive director during the 1970s, remarked that, and I quote, her accent morphed. It was different when she spoke to the press, her adoring audiences, or to her bad babies. And it could range from Gichi Louisiana or become the grittiest street corner banter. Like the theatrical form she spawned, global, multicultural, cross-disciplinary, and just damn undeniably La Mama, Ellen Stewart herself was a hybrid before anyone envisioned that possibility, end quote. There are many videos where we can hear Ellen Stewart speaking different varieties of, ac of accents, uh, different varieties of English, I'm sorry. And I'm just gonna share with you uh, just a minute and a half clip from an interview for you to, um, wait a minute. If I can. 
understand. Okay, so tell me about the cowbell. The it cow wasn't bell. the cowbell, dear. It was just a bell. It was just a bell. A bell. Uh, when we started down in this little basement that could hold 25 people. It was on 9th Street? 9th yeah, Street, there was a big crowd. I didn't know how to start the show. And somebody gave me a bell and said, just ring the bell and say something. And that's the bell. And so for 40 something years. 43. 43 40. years. Mm -hmm. Whenever you're here, you come out and greet the audience. That's right. And you say. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to La Mama. <laughs> welcome to La Mama at CINX. Or welcome to La Mama in our, what we call our main building. And I say we are dedicated to the playwright in all aspects of the theater. And I do mean all of that. And you do mean all. Right. OK. Um, in the video that documents uh, one of dual theater performances of White Whore and Big Player, we hear La Mama customary bell announcing the beginning of the performance, followed by Ellen Stewart's typical welcome, as uh, you heard um, in, 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 that, uh, in that video. And she says, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to La Mama Repertory Theater, dedicated to the playwright and all aspects of the theater. Tonight, we're very proud to present Tom Ayen's White Whore and the Big Player. The play is presented by the Duo Theater, a resident group of La Mama. The ensemble is directed by Manuel Martin. Our guest star this night is Miss Candy Darling. We don't know. Why Ellen Stewart pronounced Manuel Martin's name a la Francaise, Manuel Martin, as opposed to al Espanol, Manuel Martin. But it makes us wonder how the audience would have decoded a Spanish pronunciation of the director's name in English in an English off of Broadway production. Was the French pronunciation part of La Mama's, uh, of Ellen Stewart's theatrics? Or might she have been avoiding unconsciously the negative connotation La Mama audience could make between a Spanish accent and the ethnicities associated with it based on prejudice evaluation? Although I cannot offer a definitive answer, Alavau's replacement, because of her accent, is an unfortunate but perfect example of the contradictory ways in which accented speech and immigrant performance aesthetics suffer under racism in Latina theater even in a space that welcome other cultures such as La Mama. Martin's transcultural directorial st style, part camp, part grotesque, led to his success at La Mama. But this initial triumph came at the expense of a Latina lesbian being replaced by an Anglo trans star. After the success of The White Whore, Alabao encouraged Martin to write. He conducted research and wrote his first play, Francesco, The Life and Times of the Cenci. Francesco focuses on violence and its after effects. The play incorporated Latin American process of creación colectiva, collective creation, or what in English we now know as devised theater, and was staged following the experimental aesthetics of the moment. Martin interweaved Latin American theatrical aesthetics, avant-garde European theater, primarily Artaud and Piscator, Grotoskian techniques, and US experimental theater in this Latino off-of-Broadway play to address indirectly some of the ghosts and traumas of 1950s and 1960s Cuban culture, as well as traumas of US history as they impacted its citizens under, during the early 1970s. The play, while historically placed elsewhere, Renaissance Italy, addressed issues of excess of power, mob violence, simulation at the level of church and state and inquisition-like trials, which resonated with Alabaos and other gays experiences in Cuba during Batista in the 1950s and during the first decade of the revolution, as well as with what was going on in the US with the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War, and other US military interventions in, and their portrayal by the US media. I am not suggesting an allegorical reading. 
Rather, I claim that at the core of this play is an, ana an analysis of violence, of good and evil, of the thirst for power, and ultimately of behavior under dehumanizing conditions. Similar to Grotowski, Martin reinterpreted classical texts and stories through social and political readings of his time so that his theater, and I quote Grotowski, confronts our very roots with our current behavior and stereotypes. And in this way shows our today in perspective with yesterday and our yesterday with today. Francesco was produced in English in 1973 and then in Ana Maria Simos translation in November, both at La Mama. Martin, like Fornes, was a director who really focused on the visual elements and plasticity of his plays. He used cinematographic and experimental techniques that were close to Grotowski's and Brooks' works in the sense that the actors became the visual medium to transmit the ideas and images of the play. And Grotowski, as a matter of fact, had been the highlight of the 69-70 theatrical season in Off of Broadway. Music also plays an important role in uh, my analysis of both the English and Spanish production of Francesco as a Latina Off of Broadway play. Martin conducted extensive research for this play. He must have read Artos Le Shenshi and seen La Mama's most awaited production of Le Shenshi in 1971. Thus, he knew that sound was key for Artos theater of cruelty and that Artos Paris staging of Le Shenshi was actually his only production of theater of cruelty. Furthermore, the Sarmier's use of music in Artos Le Shenshi is important because it was the first time that stereophonic sound was used in theater. Although Martin's script does not refer to sound design, Martin asked Enrique Vieta to compose original music for the staging. The, sta the choice was not gratuitous. Uvieta was a modernist Cuban composer credited with having invented bimodalism. He studied at the Moscow Conservatory with Aram Kashaturium in 1960. Cuban vanguardista composers consider Kashaturian, Uvieta's mentor, conservative, both aesthetically and ideologically. Ironically, Uvieta the exile, who arrived in New York in 1967, capitalized on his fame as a vanguardia composer, although his compositions were, like those of his master, musically less revolutionary than those of his peers who stayed in Havana. In order to reconstruct the theatrical soundscape of Francesco, I analyzed Uvieta's Momento Renascentista, video recordings of both productions, and I also addressed the acoustic horizon of expectations of Martins and La Mama's audiences. Uvieta's music track from Francesco was inspired in Renaissance music, but it had a modernist harmony and rhythm that may sound to the untrained ear strident at times and not melodic, almost atonal. He directed the quintet for the recording that was used on stage. And he composed two independent melodic lines that complement each other, one major and one minor, but you can actually discern between the two. The result was a sparse texture with few instruments and with, and with thick chords that at times sounded almost like noise. The end of the Spanish version of Francesco is exemplary of the concentration of signs typical of Martin's directorial style, which Latinized and transculturated grotesque and poor theater techniques. After the Pope condemns Beatrice, he leaves to the music of a trombone and percussion. And I'm just gonna play a very short clip of the music so that you see what, or hear what I'm talking about. I don't know. So, oh wait, so you can see that. Uh, 
So after the Pope condemns Beatrice, like I said, he leaves uh, slowly to the music of the trombone that we just heard that connotes the solemnity that usually accompanies Popes, but that is in direct clash with his last words, I'm going to take my siesta. Furthermore, the Pope's costume is kitschy, over the top, and his hand and body movements queer the supposed legality and religiosity of the scene. When Beatrice says her final words, the music plays louder, eventually drowning her voice. The female voice first, and then the wind instrument almost sound like a cry. It could be the cry or scream, not only of Beatrice, but of all the victims of this, strategy, of this tragedy and of any society where male aggression and female victimization is naturalized and condoned by the church, the state, and the legal system. Beatrice walks slowly backstage as the other actors create a circle and cover her with their capes. The stage goes dark and you hear the wind instruments and loud dissonant chords of the piano suggesting her decapitation. When the music finishes, actors shed their costumes in front of the audience, put on their normal clothes, and the narrator facing the audience says the play's final words. And I quote, cruelty engenders cruelty. Good evening and thank you. In the documentary video, you can actually hear audience members murmuring after the lapidary phrase, uh, phrase about cruelty. Although Beatrice is killed at the end, the play foregrounded how a woman rebels against authoritarianism and systemic violence, committing the most heinous crime, parasite. Martin, like his off of Broadway contemporaries, avoided psychological characterization and emotionally based acting and reimagined the relationship between performer and spectator. But he did so Latinizing grotesquean techniques and taking advantage of Ubieta's bimodal music. The repetition of musical motifs with minimalist variations in harmony and, total, and tonal dissonance that border on atonality reflected contemporary avant-garde aesthetics. If you think of, for example, Philip Glass music, which was uh, uh, the playing in off of Broadway at the moment. The repetitive structure of the music, I'm, I'm sorry, however, the inspiration of Renaissance motifs, typical of the Cuban Vanguardia composers, was a strange sound in off of Broadway circles. The repetitive structure of the music, along with the rest of the elements of the play, must have made Francesco spectators ask themselves, like those of Grotowski's Acropolis, and I quote, under similar circumstances, what would I do? What would happen to all my polite, civilized values? Would I too crack? what would become of me. It's no wonder that Alberto Oliva, critic for ABC de las Americas, named Fran Francesco the first purely experimental play of the local Hispanic scene. To conclude, as is well known, Marirene Fornes went on to found the important Hispanic playwrights residence laboratory at INTAR and trained several generations of Latino artists. Manuel Martin Jr. enrolled in Fornes's inter lab in the 1980s and wrote and staged many important plays with overt Latina themes. He was one of the first playwrights to stage the effects of homophobia in Cuba and its diaspora. He was also the first to include lesbian characters in US Cuban theater. Magalia Laval, through the off of Broadway artistic networks in which she was an important node, continued her career as an actress with Medusa's Revenge, the first lesbian uh, performance group in New York, which she co-founded with Ana Maria Simo in 1976. Medusa's Revenge was an experimental theater of women, uh, I mean, of lesbian women, dedicated to the creation of, of original plays, exploring a homo aesthetic sensibility. It operated as a lesbian only space till 1981. As I've shown today, Marirene Fornes, Magalia Lavao, Manuel Martin Jr., along with Roberto Rodriguez Suarez, Latinized the off of Broadway theater movement. Additionally, they laid the groundwork for the playwrights who will become famous during the 1980s and 90s. The rest of my book analyzes precisely the aesthetic and political ways in which the work of US Cuban playwrights engage with both Cuban exile and US American cultural traditions during those two decades. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your comments and your questions. Well, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Lillian. I think that is uh, 
such a rich topic because um, it it can potentially go off into in so many directions. The, the avant-garde, um, ties between New York and all kinds of places, uh, linguistic ties. Um, and so happily, we've already got questions, but I'll remind people um, that if you want to ask questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A uh, and I'll read them out uh, and uh, Lynn can then answer. Uh, and the first question comes from Logan Connors, uh, who says, hey, Lynn, such a great talk. What do you think about the idea that post-dramatic or minimalist avant-garde theater contributed to the idea of accent neutrality, an impossible concept? Meaning that an aesthetic of neutral decor, universal settings, et cetera, may have enabled this sociolinguistic process of accent discrimination. The idea being that everybody, sorry, everything should be without geography, meaning in an Anglo-American context in English. So, so. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's uh, that's a, uh, yeah, that's a, a very good question. Um, and I mean, so I think here um, the issue is that uh, the way that I see it, so the question of accents in the US on the US stages is much more important than the question of accents elsewhere. Um, so here, accent neutrality, um, whether it's in English, I mean, in Spanish, accent neutrality depends on where you're at. If it's in television, uh, on television, it's like Mexican, which is, uh, or Colombian, right, which is not neutral at all. Um, and uh, I mean, in New York, uh, accent neutrality, I mean, and oftentimes it's also like, uh, uh, yes, like nondescripts, right? Um, and so this impossibility of accent neutrality um, gets, I mean, on the one hand, uh, I mean, it, it's um, or the search for that impossibility um, continues actually to this day, as is, I mean, the other kind of the other, uh, I guess, the other side of this question of accents, um, especially in when you're talking about uh, Latino theater in Spanish, where if it's um, you know a play by a U.S. Cuban, then you want actors to speak like U.S. Cubans would, as if U.S. Cubans all spoke the same way. Or if it's a Chicano play, um, then you want the actors to speak as a Chicano. And so to have in uh, a Latino play a mix, right, of accents of of um, whether in Spanish or English, right, or various accents um, is often not, is, is often considered as something uh, negative. Um, so um, yeah, it, it, it's a, a, uh, an important question. I'm not sure if, if, uh, if I've answered, uh, uh, Logan, if I've answered your question. <laughs> I'm gonna uh, throw out another question from Logan and then tack what am my own on. Um, was there a big Spanish speaking theater public in 1960s, 1970s New York City? And would that public have been in tune with the more avant-garde artists you discussed? And I wanted to, uh, that relates to a question I was asking. You, you quoted a Spanish language critic um, at the end. Um, is, is there much discussion of these plays in Spanish language media? Um, and did they uh, freak out people in those media as much as some of the avant-garde plays in English freaked out <laughs> certain groups in, in the US media? Yes. Um, so there was, yes, a wide, uh, wide and varied uh, audience, right? Um, for Spanish performances in New York in the 60s. Um, and there were, you know, many other companies um, that I didn't talk about, but like the main ones, right? So Repertorio Español uh, in, um, in, in the 1970s staged more classical Spanish, uh, I mean, peninsular plays of like classical drama, Lope de Vega, etc., as well as classical U.S. Uh, American, right? So U.S. plays. Uh, from the 40s and, and, and 50s. Um, 
uh, the Puerto Rican traveling theater uh, in you know late 60s and 70s was doing more not exactly, uh, not a geek prop, but more community-based theater. And then you had various other companies, such as Teatro Duo, I mean, and others, uh, the Puerto Rican Traveling, uh, the, um, uh, the New York Rican Poets Cafe, et cetera, who were more, um, you know, uh, in tune or in sync, I guess, with the avant-garde, uh, the, the off-of-Broadway aesthetics. Um, where, you know, there was nudity, there was experimentation, um, you know, there was a mixture of performances with visual artists, and um, there was also a Spanish audience for that. Um, and the, 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 I mean, the, those Spanish audiences would go to La Mama, like Manuel Martin and Magali Alabao and many others. Um, and, you know, they would go to the New York and Poets Cafe. So, yeah, the community varied and uh, the theater companies also varied in aesthetics and, I mean, politically, they also varied. Um, the press. And so the Spanish press usually, um, yes, so responded to nudity and, you know, what was going on on stage. Um, it, not with disgust, but, um, you know, uh, almost categorizing this place as, you know, pornographic and indecent for the family, et cetera. Um, much as some of the mainstream, you know, Anglo press or US press in English did, right? So the Village Voice um, was like really the, the I guess the, the, the newspaper, right? Uh, the magazine that, um, followed more closely, and I guess with better eyes, um, not better eyes, but, you know, with eyes that, that could see what was going on um, in off of Broadway. And there are a few, but I mean, very few uh, reviews in the Village Voice, too, of some of these, um, of some of these Spanish plays. So, yeah. Thanks. Uh, Lilian Lugo. Uh again compliments the uh, presentation and says, could you talk a bit more about transculturation and Grotto Grotowski's? Grotowski. Grotow oh, sorry. <laughs> and Manuel Martin's uh, work. Uh, why him? Uh, how would he tackle actors training? Yes. So, um... I think not, I, I mean, I think so. So Manuel Martin um, saw many of uh, Grotowski's performances uh, in New York. He read uh, Grotowski while actually, while he was in Europe, he went to Europe for a while, um, not for a while, but like the summer before uh, to do research on Francesco. And um, from Grotowski, he, uh, he focused on actually, yes, the actor's training, body movements, and the kind of uh, repetition that Grotowski worked with in order to have the, uh, in order for movements to become like natural for the actor, but not completely natural. Um, and he, um, and so Martin borrowed that from Grotowski. Martin also borrowed from Grotowski um, the, um, if you want, kind of the, the simplicity or the bareness of the stage and the focus on the actor and the actor's movement, right? Um, but then he, you know, I guess over, uh, it had like this layer, right, of campiness and kitschiness um, that was um, prevalent in, in New York at the time. So when I say transculturated, what I'm saying is that he, I mean, there's a mixture of all of these um, aesthetic tendencies, right? That he brought together. Um, he would train, uh, he would train with the actors in the, in Francesco, for example, um, he came with like a rough idea of the script. Um, he had um, like scenes that he wanted to, uh, to stage, but then the actors um, 
rehearsed and added uh, to uh, to his ideas. And actually, um, uh, so Magali Alabao, uh, I mean, who acted and was also assistant director, says so. Martin would come; he would have these snippets of what they wanted to work on, and then uh, he would turn on the, the his play record, his um, tape recorder, right. And then he would tape record the whole rehearsal, go back home, um, and then work on what had happened, right, in that space, and then rewrite the script and then come. Come back, you know, the next day and continue. Thanks. No, excuse me. Uh, the uh, next question comes from Yolanda, uh, Yolanda Martinez San Miguel. Um, you're using the notion of Latina to refer to plays produced before Latino studies was a field. How do you apply the no notion of Latina? And what are some of the challenges of using this category to refer to Hispanic authors and performers from this time period? Yes. So um, in this time period, you had Chicano theater um, and you had what you know, was in New York called Hispanic theater when it was produced uh, in Spanish. Um, and um, I mean, and the term New Yorican came on and kind of just a little bit later, but no, I actually kind of around that uh, period. Um, and so when, um, okay, so when theater history for Hispanic theater history in the US you know, begins in the 60s, they usually say, okay, so 1965 is the start of, Latin, you know, what was then Latino theater in the US in 1965 is the Chicano theater movement um, with, uh, with Teatro Campesino, right? Um, now, all of this work, as I, I mean, I mean, the book I show, there was plenty of theater happening uh, by, Hispanics or Spanish descendants, okay, quote unquote for the time being, uh, prior to 1965 uh, and prior to the Chicano theater movement. So you had, I mean, from that you had like Chicano theater and New York theater. Cuban theater in the US was like exile theater for reasons that I'm not gonna get into now, right? Um, then there is a move in, uh, in um, yeah, I mean, in, in Latino studies and theater studies in around the late, mid eighties, late eighties to early nineties to say Chicano slash Latino theater. Um, then it goes from, you know, Chicano slash the Chicano with the at and Latina with the at, the, the at sign to avoid the, the I mean, the, the marked masculine, right? Uh, of Spanish in the term. And then you go to Latinx, um, relatively recent. Um, and so it's Chicanx and Latinx. I have, you know, um, not toggled, but uh, like struggled with what term to use. And I opted for Latine with an E, um, I mean, just for this book and, and for this presentation. Um, one, because it's a term like Latino, it's a term that comes from Spanish, but the E is what's used more often in Latin America and uh, I mean, in parts of the Caribbean uh, to deal with the O and the X, which in Spanish is completely, uh, you know, you, you can't just pronounce in Spanish that X, right? As <laughs> easier as you can in English Latinx or, um, and so, uh, what so in when I talk about Hispanic theater in New York or Spanish theater in New York, um, I use it because that's how it was referred to at the time, right? But right now, um, when others talk about that period, they talk about Latino theater in New York in the '60s. Although the term Latino, yes, did not come into being until the '90s. So. Um, it's not a good answer. It's not an easy solution. Um, but I think that just, I mean, it's perpetuating the Hispanic category um, is not a good one either. So it's, yeah, <laughs> suggestions <laughs> for how to address it, you know, are welcome. 
Yeah. And I do talk, I mean, I do tease that out uh, in, uh, I mean, in the introduction and the longer version too of, of this chapter. These are kind of issues that are not unique to, to your field right now in the mm -hmm. medieval studies. And we're thinking, is, is the term Anglo-Saxon, which is a, an anachronistic term, is that useful or indeed acceptable anymore? Yes, yes. So we have- a Which is, I'm sorry, which is also the Anglo. I like, you know, at times I'm using like Anglo theater, <laughs> uh, you know, and I know that, uh, you know, but it's Anglo versus Spanish theater because those are kind of the categories at the time. But yeah, yeah. Anglo theater, like it's also a problematic term. Um, we're at eight, but I'm going to take time for a couple more questions. Uh, one is pretty short, um, just um, uh, co another compliment on the talk and uh, asking if there's any uh, a paper version of this yet uh, uh, with the bibliography, the archives work, is there a version in circulation or will the audience have to wait for the book? <laughs> <laughs> If anybody wants to, uh, you know, wants to have a, a reader version of this, I can certainly share. It's, I mean, it's part of a longer version. Uh, like I said, it's part of the second chapter of my book, but I, you know, uh, working on archives, I believe in open archives and post-custodial <laughs> archives. So I am, I can share what I've written and of course share the bibliography. And then the last question, um, how do you think the uses of accent have changed in, in experimental theater today? Hmm. Good question. Yeah, an experimental theater today is, I mean, like off of Broadway, right? Uh, an experimental theater in the 60s and 70s is a kind of a, a, a huge category. Um, but I mean, I think it depends. Um, uh, I think accents are more acceptable um, and not acceptable. I think that accents are becoming part of the experimentation um, of theater and performance nowadays and mixture of accents uh, on, uh, on, you know, on, especially in, 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 in performance. Um, and in theater as well. Um, and I think that also that uh, with some of the um, um, kind of intermediate work that is happening nowadays where you've got, you know, dance theater with um, uh, videos on stage, uh, with virtual reality, um, accents are also so accents are part of that um, of that uh, of of the various um, things that are happening on stage and of the um, of the yeah of of the various um, I mean, changes uh, not change, but crossings right that are happening on stage. So um, I think it's becoming much more uh, common. I have, I mean, Lillian Lugo wrote a, an excellent dissertation on intermediality uh, in theater, and she calls these, this kind of work uh, archipelagic. Um, and so um, I suppose we could say that, yeah, like the, the archipelagos uh, of experimental theater on stage are not naturalizing, but just uh, letting accents happen and uh, and be just one part, accent like verbal accents, right? Uh, be part of all of the other accents that we're seeing on stage. Body has an accent, um, whether it's male, whether it's female, whether it's trans, um, whether it's um, you know the Afro-Latino, et cetera. So colorism um, accents are all part and parcel of what's happening in experimental theater. Okay, well, um, I'll uh, end up tonight's session with a big thank you on behalf of the audience, sort of channeling all that applause that would come in if we were live. Um, really appreciate it, really enjoyed it. Uh, and I want to thank the uh, audience for coming. And um, we hope to see you again uh, at future events. Uh,
book talks, Stanford terrors, and more of these humanities hours. So uh, once again, I'll just uh, uh, end with thanking everybody in the audience and especially uh, Professor Manzor for a great talk and have a great evening. Thank you. And thank you all for the questions. <laughs>